our own Steve Hubbard is going to talk to us about a recent road trip that he took down to West Virginia with Bob Horton to visit the Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia. And he's going to, uh, Steve, Steve's going to talk about some interesting insights that he gained with regard to radio astronomy, as well as, of course, having a wonderful dark sky site for observing, which, of course, will make us jealous here. So take it away, Steve. Uh, thank you, Ed, for that. And thank you, everybody in the Zoom world for joining. It's great to see so many people that don't have an awful lot else to do tonight, so it's great to have you here. <laughs> um, if, as I've, before I begin the slide part of this, I do want to show uh, the program here. I'm going to leave this up front if you're interested in seeing what this program looks like that I went to. It's called StarQuest. That's run by a group in the, uh, the Appalachian Astronomy Society. Uh, I'm going to leave that up here, give you an idea of what went on. There's also a site map of Green Bank, along with a little description of some of the radio telescopes that are there. If you want to take a look at that, too. Uh, unfortunately, Bob Horton couldn't join me tonight. He had uh, an, al an alternate uh, engagement, but he did send along some pictures. He took some really great night sky pictures that I'll be sharing with you. This is going to be basically somewhat of a travel log. Uh, I'm going to be showing. Well, there I am. Yeah. We're still learning every month. Every month we, we get better. We get better. <laughs> are, are we recording this? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so right up there. See? <laughs> so this is going to be a travel log more than anything else because it does involve uh, Bob and I traveling down to West Virginia to attend a star party called StarQuest, which that group down there, the Appalachian group, has been running for quite a few years. And they didn't have it for the last couple of years. I think we all know why. But this all, yes? Mm -hmm. Oh, I just wanted to, we wanted to move this so we could see your face. Oh. This all started for me a couple of years ago. I subscribed to a publication oh. <laughs> called Astronomy Magazine. They were. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Just in my turn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, there's two. <laughs> Is anybody able to see the back of my head? <laughs> <laughs> we have another camera. We can do that. <laughs> anyway. A couple of years ago, I was looking in astronomy, amateur astronomy magazine, and one section they have is upcoming star parties throughout the country. And one of the things I'd like to do is occasionally try to go to some other star parties. Some of them are pretty far away. They're across the country or the middle of the country, and they're not quite as enticing. But I saw this one in West Virginia, and what interested me most about it was, first of all, that it was at Green Bank, which is a pretty famous radio astronomy site that's been ongoing for the you know, since the early, mid, actually mid 1950s. And then I looked up the distance and it said, wow, it's about 600 miles, only 10 hours. That's if you don't make any stops and you're not older and you do need to make stops. <laughs> it took us about 13 hours coming back. Uh, we, Bob and I took two days to get there. We stopped off in Pennsylvania to see a friend, but we did drive all the way back 13 hours. It can be done. It's not Fun, but uh, I did it. Today. And uh, the reason I'm mentioning these things is because I'm hoping that maybe some some of you would be interested in coming next year. There, I've got the dates for it, which I show at the end, and it is a really fun time. So let me go into the presentation. And am I seeing what they're seeing now, or how is that working? I, I kind of need to this. So it's about 600 miles. Um, nobody can see the presentation though. No. Did you share your screen? Oh, I got to share my screen. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so I go to the <clears throat> Here. Oh, I got to open it up and share. Okay. I'm sorry about okay. that. No, that's all right. We're all learning here. <laughs> this is something okay. new. So, there. Start slideshow. Yeah, slideshow Start from the beginning. All right. Okay, from the beginning. Yeah. Yep. There, I start with a blank screen. I don't know why you wanted that, but here it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, like the song, almost have in West Virginia, especially for astronomers. <laughs> and I just mentioned that. I do have some kind of general, a few general pictures to show you what the area is like. I've never been down in that area. I haven't had a reason to go down until fairly recently. But uh, 
going through there, Bob and I found it was actually somewhat similar to parts of New England. It reminded us a lot of Western Maine, very heavily forested. In fact, I think it's one of the most heavily forested states in the country. A lot of low rolling hills, at least in the area we were in, we're beginning to see the Appalachians. A lot of big open farmland, beautiful farms through there. And they had some areas of really craggy mountains. This was at a rest stop that we took, a uh, little country store nearby. And they had a lot of little tiny towns. Uh, I don't know if this one was live or not, but it looked interesting and kind of exemplified what I thought we saw throughout West Virginia. And then uh, again, more low rolling hills, uh, beautiful scenery, very pretty to drive through, very pleasant once you get in there. So after about two days, we finally get close to Green Bank. And you turn left at this sign and you go down and you gradually, a few miles away, you can begin to see the big radio dish there. Now, what I wanna point out here is in orange in the center, you can see where it says NRAL, that's where Green Bank is. And to the right of it, you see Sugar Grove. That's actually uh, another area where they do have radio telescopes, but those are all run by the NSA and they're listening in on everybody's phone calls and things in there. <laughs> they're not doing that at NRAO, the uh, Green Bank. But the orange square there is a radio quiet zone, so-called. This is about 13,000 miles, if I remember my number correctly, of an area where they discourage people from using electronic devices. Uh, they are not really happy about people using Wi-Fi. They're battling that now. And I think they're somewhat losing. And um, it's a very different area for people that live there because if you live in that area, you don't, you're not as likely to have the same level of communications that we have here, which according to what I've read, the rest, some, a lot of the residents actually like. They do fight against it, but it's a very different experience. As you get close to the, the Green Bank area, your cell phone coverage drops out. You cannot use a cell phone there. They still have pay phones. So Superman would be happy there. <laughs> if you are dependent on the cell phone and the internet, it makes it a little bit more challenging. And this is the entrance to Green Bank. And I've got a little bit of history here about the observatory. Uh, the site was chosen in December of 1955. And the primary thing that they were looking for was an area that was pretty rural, that uh, wasn't likely to be developed, that would have a lot of hills or mountains around it that would block any kind of radio interference for the long term. That's the reason that they chose Green Bank. The telescopes are situated in a valley. They're surrounded by some hills and mountains, and it is a pretty remote area. And in October of 1958, they dedicated the first big telescope there. It's an 85-foot across dish, uh, the Tattel Telescope. And from uh, Green Bank, they discovered the uh, radiation belts around Jupiter in 1959. And April 1960, Project Ozma. This was the very first SETI search, and it used the 85 foot Tattel telescope. Is anybody familiar with Project Ozma? Mm -hmm. That was an effort by Frank Drake, Frank Drake who was an astronomer at Green Bay to try to send out the first, or not to send out, to try to receive the first potential signals from extraterrestrial civilizations. They looked at, I think, two stars to try to see if they could see any kind of signal within the radio frequencies that were being received. Uh, they all, Frank Drake was also famous for uh, the Drake equation. And for those of you that are familiar with it, it has a lot of different variables in it that tries to predict how many intelligent civilizations there could be in the galaxy, such as the number of planets, the number of habitable planets, the number of technological civilizations, the number of technolo technological civilizations that haven't blown themselves up and that ultimately arrive at a number that could predict how many civilizations were out there. That was something that he's most famous for that endures today. One of the first things to, to bear in mind is there were no extrasolar planets that, that were discovered that early on. So that was strictly all speculation on. And it's still somewhat is. You know. <laughs> uh, September 
1962, they did the first observations with a really large telescope, which was a 300 foot telescope, which was a fully steerable, steerable dish. And in 1972, they confirmed a dark matter from here. And in November of 1988, the 300 foot dish collapses. Uh, that was the result of mental fatigue in one small area of the telescope. Fortunately, nobody was injured but the entire dish collapsed down onto the building that was supporting it. And then in 2001, they built another telescope, the James Bird uh, 300 meter dish that uh, is there now. And it's the uh, largest fully steerable dish in the uh, world right now. So when you get there, you walk around some of the trails and you see signs like this. It's a quiet zone, uh, especially as you get closer to the actual telescopes. They don't want you to use even things like digital cameras because they uh, send out a little signal. Portable music players, mobile phones, video cameras, portable video games, anything like that. They do permit film cameras. <laughs> so, how many of those do you count anymore? Film cameras? What's that? <laughs> Are you letting him talk? <laughs> So this was the banner that greeted us. And this is the visitor center where they hold all the uh, events, the talks, the food is all there and everything. And it's a really nice visitor center. It's fairly modern. Uh, they have classrooms in there. They have a cafe, they have a gift shop. Uh, it's very comfortable and it's a great place to go and attend a star party. Is that taken with film? <laughs> no, these weren't. I do have some in here, as I'll explain later, that we did have to use film for. But I these were all. away with using a camera. For that. Well, you can use a digital camera if you're not within an even closer range of the telescopes, which I'll explain. And they have some uh, uh, some displays there of some uh, early radio telescopes. One of which is this one. It's a reconstruction of the original directional antenna used in the discovery of radio missions by uh, Carl Jansky. And that was at Bell Telephone Laboratories at Holmdale, New Jersey in 1932. So this was the first real radio telescope. And this is a reproduction, but it's uh, very uh, true to the original. And that's what it looks like. And you can see it. <coughs> you can see it spins around on the base and it doesn't do much, but just kind of give you a real general idea that, you know, there are some radio waves coming from up, uh, up there beyond the Earth. And then they now use something called a Jansky to measure the uh, signals from space. That's a unit of uh, measurement. And I don't know how to explain that other than there it is. You can take from that as you want, what you wish. And then they also have this. Um, in 1937, Grote Reber, he built a parabolic dish telescope next to his mother's house in Wheaton, Illinois. And this was the first steerable, really usable uh, radio dish. Um, he was able to find radio emissions from Cassiopeia, the Milky Way, and the sun. And he also created the first radio map in the sky. And this is the original radio dish. It's, it's there now. And you, you see, it's still probably workable. They don't use it. It's just on display, but that's what Rose Reber actually used. And there. And then there's a picture of Bob, my traveling companion, next to it. And then this is another display. It's a horn antenna uh, used by Harold Ewan and Eric. Edward in Purcell at the Lyman Lab of Physics at Harvard in 1951. This was the instrument that they used to discover uh, to make the first detection of radio radiation from neutral atomic hydrogen gas in the Milky Way. Uh, this is the 21 centimeter wavelength, which is now so important to radio astronomy in terms of mapping of the universe. It's not very big. It's probably about four feet across or so. It doesn't look too impressive, but that's the original and that was there. So after you pass the visitor center and some of the displays, uh, we get to the camping field. And this is the camping field. You can see it's a very large open uh, pasture-like area, very flat, which was nice. Off on the right, you can see there's a barn. And 
That's important because that's a relatively new building and they have showers and bathrooms, which is good because if you're camping and you need to use a bathroom either at night or whenever, it's not that far a walk. And you've got showers, which is also a wonderful thing, especially for any of us that have gone to a place like Cellophane, <laughs> which is another astronomical camping event that has nothing like that. It's, it's good. And it, it's kind of a, a fun place also because you've got radio telescopes surrounding the field. Uh, this is not the Tatil. I think this is a 45-foot dish, which was used portably for some years. So this is to just give you an idea of the facilities, the camping area. And this is the 300 meter telescope. This is the view you get from the campground, which is really pretty spectacular. And it makes it another fun venue to go to because it's right there and you see it moving at night. It's uh, surrounding, you know, you can see the surrounding mountains and get an idea of why they wanted that telescope and the other facilities in that area. And then, you know, like any other star party, there are telescopes there. This is one of our speakers, actually, Shane Larson. He's the doctor from uh, University of Chicago that came in, and I guess has been coming there for a number of years. And he brought a 22 inch uh, F5 Newtonian, which I get to look through. And a big telescope like that is always a lot of fun to look through, especially since uh, I don't feel like lugging anything that big myself. It's good to have other people bring it for you. And Did he was, build that, Steve? Sorry? Did he build that? I don't remember. I think he might have. I'm, I'm pretty sure he did but I'm not positive. And this was our campground site. Uh, there was one tree in the area, which was kind of a detriment because it does get pretty hot there, but we managed to snag a spot near that so we at least had some shade, which was a plus. And then if you don't feel like camping, they also have this. It's a bunkhouse that uh, you can stay in. They have uh, showers and other facilities right there with that. Uh, so, you, you know, it's not just camping. You don't have to feel like you have to go and sit in the tent or anything like that. You can also arrange to go and be in the bunkhouse. They have a cafe cafeteria right there, too, and you can get a food, food plan with that. The food was decent, and they have a cafe for lunch. So it, it's, you know, a great facility if this is something that you're interested in. So this is the uh, registration area. They had somebody set up with a lot of meteorites and tech tights for sale. And of course, Bob Horton couldn't even get through to the registration area before stopping, having to stop and take a look at the wares, uh, the items that were being sold there. And then, like any other good star party, they had a number of uh, raft lamps. In fact, this goes down the entire hallway, and they had a total of 98. Uh, Bob and I had to leave before the, the final day, <coughs> it escaped all raffles, unfortunately. Uh, so we don't know how long it took to do 98 of them, but uh, quite a bit of stuff there. They had an astronomy vendor there, and he had set up a whole bunch of different things you could buy, eyepieces, telescopes, all that sort of stuff. And this is the atrium inside the visitor center. So you can see it's a beautiful area. and. You can't really see it too well in this picture, but from there you can look out over the 300 meter teles radio telescope. And then to the left of this is the gift shop, and then to the right is the cafeteria. Within that building, they also have a small museum devoted to radio astronomy and astronomy in general. They had a number of displays there showing things like original uh, radio telescope equipment, some of the electronics, explaining various facts about the universe. This is a model of the 300 meter, and it was fully steerable from inside. And then here, you've got a picture on the upper left of the current telescope that's in use, and then to the lower right, you can see the remains of the 300 foot telescope that collapsed and what was left of it, we before and after there. So fortunately, nobody was hurt, but it was pretty amazing that that didn't happen. Now here, Bob is next to a like an alien. <laughs> yeah, We all had to wear masks in there. It's a federal facility, and uh, their rules are a little bit different. But everybody had to wear a mask indoors. But you can see there's a long lever here, and this door is uh, plated with zinc. And then there's another one behind uh, Bob, which you can't. If I'm standing I'm behind me, rather, I'm taking a picture of Bob that looks exactly like that. What you do is you open one door, 
go through, close it, go to the other door, open it, close it, and make sure that both are open at the same time. And when you do, you come to a room that's full of computers. They are hooked up to the internet there, and you can use computers. <laughs> You can use computers, but it's in a room that's totally isolated in terms of any kind of potential electronic radiation getting out. This is the ceiling, and the walls are also coated with this. It's uh, copper foil, and it's tacked up to the ceilings and the walls and the doors to zinc so that no signals can escape, but you can still go in and at least get some connection to the outside world. This is a fuzzy picture of one of our speakers, Shane Larson, and this is a picture of one of the other speakers. And it's the facts about the Green Bay under a meter telescope. Again, I, I mentioned it's the largest fully, fully steerable dish in the world. 330 by 360 feet are the size of two football fields. It's got 2,004 aluminum panels, and they're each painted matte white so that they don't reflect too much light, which would bounce back down into the receivers and essentially cook them. That's the tallest life form made structure in West Virginia, 60% taller than the Statue of Liberty at 485 feet tall. It weighs almost 17. Um, what does tallest life form mean? Tallest life form? Well, you know, we're not supposed to say man-made now anymore. I mean, I'm just trying to be politically correct. Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. 20% of the funding now comes from the SETI Foundation for their Breakthrough Listen Project, which is the search for extraterrestrial signals. And without that, uh, this facility may not be in operation. They're not getting the funds from the federal government that they used to. Uh, this, they don't do as much science here now because it's a single dish and a lot of radio astronomy is done with a number of different telescopes linking together. So things have changed. But fortunately, they have received quite a bit of funding through uh, the SETI Foundation to keep going. And this is Saturday morning, uh, I believe either Saturday or Friday or Saturday morning, after a beautiful, dark, clear night there. Um, we had a lot of ground fog, which was actually nice because it made for some good contrasting pictures of the telescope. So this is looking out over the observing field from where our tent was to give you an idea of what you can see. This is at night, and it looks bright here, but this was, you know, not an instantaneous picture. It isn't that bright. It doesn't disturb your feeling at night, but it's kind of fun to see it in the background, you know, low on the ground uh, when you're observing at night. And this is just a picture I caught with the telescope on the left and a little tiny crescent moon just about to set over the hills in the distance. And this is a little bit of a time lapse. Uh, when we were there, they were doing some maintenance on the telescope. And they turned the lights on when we were observing one night because the maintenance they were doing was support work underneath the uh, wheel, the heavy duty track wheel systems that they used to turn the telescope and support it. And the story goes that while they were turning it and testing it at night, somebody heard a loud crack and they, for some reason, got a little concerned, <laughs> and they decided to uh, check it out. They turned all these lights on. Normally, these lights weren't on, but it actually was great because it presented a wonderful opportunity to see the telescope all lit up against the you know, dark background. And because they were doing maintenance, it worked out for us even better because we got a tour of the 300-meter radio, radio telescope. Uh, we were able to take a couple of elevators uh, up to about 400 feet above ground to see the area where the receivers were almost to the top. But you could get to an area where you could look out over the dish. Uh, no digital cameras were allowed, but they did sell some of those single point and shoot film cameras in the uh, gift shop. So Bob did buy one and I've got some pictures he took. They're not what you would get with even a good film camera with a wide angle lens or a modern digital camera, if it's film and it was just point and shoot with a little crummy lens on it. But it'll give you some idea of what it was like to go up there. Because normally when they do tours, they'll drive you around and they may take you right up to the telescope, but they don't always let people go up and stand up near the top because that would interfere with what's going on. So to get there, 
uh, surrounding the telescope, they have it pretty well marked off. You can't just drive up. You have to stop and go through a gate, and you, they don't allow the usage of uh, vehicles with regular internal combustion engines because the spark plugs send off the signal. They either have to be diesel or electronic type vehicles to approach the telescopes. And this was getting closer to it. Uh, we get up as high as uh, right about here. No, um, no actually, we, we were able to go up to this section here. And for those of you who are online and are talking about this part right here, there is a separate elevator going up like this. And you walk across a catwalk, they take you up on another elevator and drop you off here. <laughs> Which wasn't as bad as it seems. You know, they have the open grating that you can look through to see how high up you are, but you know, the railings everywhere. It wasn't, wasn't terrible. It was actually a lot of fun. So here we are beginning our journey. You have to go up a few flights of stairs to get to the elevator. And on the left here, this is our tour guide. She's one of the employees there that brought us up. Everybody had to wear hard hats. They don't want anybody injured accidentally by getting, bumping their head on any of the parts of the telescope. And this is a picture of Bob. We're not up to the top yet, but you can get an idea of where we're going. And this is one of the main uh, gears that the telescope goes up and down in, in azimuth, uh, no altitude, sorry, altitude. And this is Bob standing in front of the dish. It's vast. You can't get all of it in with a point and shoot camera, unfortunately, but hopefully you can begin to get a little sense of the scale of what we were looking at. And we're up quite high at this point, about 400 feet up, looking out over the valley. And it's pretty empty, but it's really beautiful, very scenic. And we were very lucky to be there at a time when the weather was extremely good. It was clear, it was relatively dry. So the uh, feeling was pretty good. Here's another view of the looking out across the dish at one of the other radio telescopes, which I believe is the Tattel telescope, the uh, one of the original ones there. So and it's 300 meters the diameter. It's the it's uh, the the diameter, the, the length across basically. That's yeah. <clears throat> And this is one of the catwalks that you get to walk across. It you know, wasn't that bad, but it was kind of fun. If you're not too worried about heights, it's a pretty fun thing to do. Some more of the scenery from the top. What is the pointing accuracy of that? I don't know. I guess it must be pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's very accurate. It, it's very, uh, you know, it's, from what we were told, it's extremely accurate. It moves very smoothly, and even though it's almost 17 million pounds, they have worked out exactly how to keep it on track and where it's going to be pointing. This is the elevator that we took to go up to that really high point. And this is the, uh, the telescope itself focuses all of its radio emissions onto this secondary antenna, uh, which then shoots it down to a series of different receivers again. Hard to take pictures and show you what it really looked like with this crummy little camera, but uh, each one of these is a separate opening that can be, it's uh, this bottom plate, if I can get this to work, well, the bottom plate area is like a big rotating dish. So when they want to change the receivers, they rotate this around and they funnel the radio emissions down through a different set of receivers into a room down below. And then at the bottom, you can see these gigantic wheel track uh, devices that they have that go around the whole track and get a better sense of how it's all supported. And there's another view of it. It's almost like a railroad, small version of a railroad uh, engine that uh, with all the different wheels that are on there and, and size them to support all this. And this is a picture of Bob taking a picture of the radio telescope. <laughs> And this is our campground at night, getting ready to observe. This is one picture of my, uh, I took this, I brought this because these are firefly trails. <laughs> I thought that was kind of neat. There were a lot of fireflies when we were there. There's, you know, it's big open uh, meadow areas and 
they were all sparkly with the fireflies and there were a bunch of them flying around so I made for some really neat pictures. This is, uh, well, it's, it's a duplicate of one of Bob has later so I'm not going to go into it, I'll talk about his later because his are better. And then some more of the ground fog effect which was pretty neat. And then I think this was Saturday morning. Uh, we woke up and it was more overcast. Uh, the weather was a little bit more unsettled. But again, another view of what you can see from the campground. Uh, we did have some storms go by, fortunately not on top of us. But uh, the weather was definitely more unsettled. And just some pretty pictures with the sky and the telescope. And this was Sunday morning. We got up early and uh, left for home that day. We needed to be back before uh, the thing ended. The event ended, unfortunately. Next time, hopefully, I'll get to stay the whole time. And that's my selfie. <laughs> <laughs> and now, some fantastic night sky images from our own Bob Horton. So, Bob does really good nighttime photography. You can see uh, the inside of our tent and other tents illuminated with the red lights that you find at any good star party. And we're looking up into the Milky Way here. And Bob has a water tower off the side of the field highlighted to the left. Those little lights are marking out the roadway at night in case people need to drive in or out. And here's a good shot with the uh, looking towards the, uh, the northeast from where we were, and you can see the 300 meter telescope in the foreground on the left, and then the barn to the right, and some of the other telescope, uh, some of the other people there, and the, uh, another telescope off to the right. And this is one of Bob's uh, longer term uh, dark sky exposures, Sagittarius. For those of you that are maybe newer, right here looks a little bit like a teapot. And the spout here. Is where the center of the Milky Way is roughly, and well, it looks like steam at night is the Milky Way, but it looks like it's coming out of the south for the teapot. And this is Bob's picture of uh, the white angle of Sagittarius here on the left, and then Scorpius, which you could see virtually all of the a little bit did get blocked by some trees, but you can see the two stinger tail stingers, stars of the tail, and it goes to up. And then Terry's, sorry for the pointer, but it's skipping a little. Oops, it's there. And then this is uh, Bob's picture of the uh, large radio dish illuminated from the base at night when they were doing maintenance. It's really, a, we were, actually, I feel we were lucky to be there when they were doing that at night because it made for a very dramatic picture. But that's not what you would see if you're worried about going to a star party and having all sorts of lights that would normally be off except for the red lights. So that's the end of my talk. The event comes, uh, StarQuest comes next year from June 21 to 24. Yeah, this year was uh, very close to July 4th, which was a little bit of an issue for us to think about driving home around that time through all the traffic. But if anybody's interested, uh, I'd be glad to talk to you more about it. It's a great event. It's not terribly far. We would probably go down in two days, maybe take a couple of days to come back just to make it a little less strenuous for the uh, journey, but uh, it's a lot of fun and it's a great place to visit if you haven't been there before. Are there any questions? Yes? Steve? Um, the big telescope is obviously an El Paso Big Mountain telescope, but you referred earlier to, to I think what you call the Tatel telescope. Yes. Is that equatorially mounted? That's a very good question. But you don't have the ears. No. <laughs> Steve, flip the lights on. Hello. Oh, okay, thank you. I don't know. I mean, we didn't get close to it. Uh, that telescope and some other ones are in that zone where you can only get in uh, if you have, if you get a ride on one of the green on, if you get one of the green banks. Uh, shuttle buses. We took a Green Bank shuttle bus from a visitor center to go to the 300 meter telescope. You can't drive in there. It's gated. They don't want you wandering around in there. And the strange thing is that they've been a planet walk where they you know, where they have planets, uh, markers for planets set out in a certain spacing to kind of oh, represent yeah. what they would be, uh, you know, normally 
um, you can only get so far, but you can't go see half of the planets because they're beyond this gate. I don't know who designed that and why they think that way, but it didn't make much sense. Anyway, you, well, the reason I asked that question is he's a consultant in 1955. Um, electronics didn't exist at the time. And so trying to track pure electronics is it not not <laughs> to the degree that we're accustomed to. Well, I don't know about that one. It's not one that they highlighted or talked about much, and it's not one that we got close to. So I really just call. Steve, can you stop sharing your screen so we can put you back on uh, the big screen? Steve, I have a question. Yes, Greg. Yeah. Um, are the scientists working during the day? Is that why you can't take digital pictures when you're actually at the uh, te uh, radio telescope? Uh, why is this so critical? I mean, the because it's a radio telescope, it is used. It can be, it can be and I think is used 24 7. When we were oh. there, we did get a tour of the control center, but we couldn't even bring a film camera in. They don't really want a lot of pictures and that area for whatever reason. And that was another one that was, you know, sealed off and had copper sheeting and everything in it. But they, that was during the middle of the day and they had somebody at the control center working and moving the telescope and doing observations. So they do use it all the time and that's why they don't want electronic interference. Oh, okay. But you could have digital cameras at the campground during the star party, right? Well, for the star party, they did actually relax the rules a little bit because they did allow the digital cameras there. Uh, some people, myself included, have uh, setups where my iPad has sent out a little local uh, signal that my setting circles on my telescope can send out, set up, uh, can pick up. Uh, it's you know a little local network. Uh, and they did allow some relaxation of the rules for the star party. They have a pretty good relationship with the people at the Green Bank facility. And, uh, that's why things are a little bit different. Yes, Kathy. I just wondered about security. Uh, you know, like somebody could walk in and do that and bring some horrible thing to sabotage. How much security would you have to go through? Do they prevent? Do you have to go through it on a machine or something to show you this? I can't even imagine. You know, even if you brought a canister to film, I mean, I could add something in there. They don't have that kind of security. They have a gate there. Um, there was no probing or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> there really wasn't much in the way of security because it's not that, you know, they, I guess they're just not that worried about it. Did you bring your own film camera if you wanted? Yes, as long as it's film. You just, yeah. They just yeah. don't want you to use the digital because right. whenever a digital camera shoots, it sends off a little signal enough that, you know. Do they have digital right. camera police? What? Do they have digital camera police? Uh, I'm not sure if it extends to anything that sensitive. They did have a vehicle there. Again, you know, we didn't want to use up all the film. We only had 17 exposures in our camera, but as we go through the, went through the gate, they do did have a pickup truck there with all sorts of antennas on it. They do. They Ooh. have had people that go around and try to pick up signals in the area. Basically, they try to negotiate with any of the offenders and you know try to uh, keep them from doing any of that. Where did you get the film developed? Where'd you develop the film? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to get film developed these days. Bob bought the camera. He sent it to Hunt. Uh, somewhere, I don't know where, whether he took it or mailed it, but they they took the film, they developed it, they scanned it and sent it back to them. So, does the telescope maintenance something they typically scheduled for StarQuest, or did you just get lucky with that? We just got lucky. They, they, they had to replace a section of the track when we were there, and then uh, that's why they were not actively using the telescope for a while, because while they were replacing it, they couldn't turn it and they didn't want to possibly damage it. There was a question in the back, Bob. Is there any air traffic restriction in that music for any reasons? You know, you see a lot of planes flying. I don't know. We did see some planes. Um, it is not too far from Washington, D.C. So, you know, you're likely to get some traffic. But, uh, I don't remember seeing an awful lot and there certainly weren't too many in the pictures. So I think there were some that you know, I don't think that's as big an issue because it's momentary and they're not too close.
Yes. What was the attendance? What's, what's the size of the event? There were, I think, 104 people there. And for them, that was a pretty good crowd. They uh, didn't know how many they'd get this year because there were still some restrictions. People had to wear masks. But, uh, you know, they are recovering from COVID like so many other groups are. This was the first time that they've been able to schedule an in-person event. Yes. Yeah, so it's been there since 1955. Yes. Built it. So for that period of time, have they ever detected a signal from extraterrestrial planets or star galaxies? Uh, not that they've told anybody. <laughs> as far as they, they claim, they haven't. Has anyone in another in another radio? We don't know. No, but nobody for sure has that we know about. But as they say, the truth is out there. So, so what happens if they just go for another hundred years and then <laughs> they don't find it? Are they can continue to kind of receive signals, or I don't know. We don't know. We don't know. I mean, it, a lot of the SETI Institute is funded by some very wealthy individuals, um, some of the billionaire class, and they, for whatever reason, have an interest in trying to find these signals. So. You know, whether they continue on or not, I don't know. You know. It's not government funding anymore that's really supporting this place, although some of it's coming through. I don't think I'll touch on costs for people interested in that ship. Uh, it's just if anybody's interested in going, it wasn't really expensive. I think the whole thing, including camping, came to about $100. Uh, gas is another um, thing altogether. It did take some to drive 600 miles each way. Um, but, uh, you know, if you have more than one person in a car, it's not that bad. It's just more time than anything else. Any, any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Steve.